Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. It feels like law enforcement and the community have spent much of the past 10 days appealing to anonymous party goers to come forward while the search for Kylie has gone on. 11 days later, we barely have an idea what Kylie was even wearing. So you can imagine how thin the actual tips from those who were actually there really are. Given the search has come up with next to nothing, it makes sense, in my view, to ratchet up the investigation. If the mountain won't come to Muhammad, and yet the mountain is a reference to some 300 teenagers and partygoers, then I think law enforcement needs to start pursuing the 300 vigorously. Before we get to the rest of this episode, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment. If you're enjoying the coverage, you're welcome to hit the thanks button. And let's get started. Now, I do believe there are sufficient digital breadcrumbs to do that, to pursue the 300 uh, vigorously. And so I guess from now on, we're going to be referring to the party goers as the 300, right? Now, whether law enforcement can or will take that step is clearly their prerogative. But one thing for sure is we've gotten a lot of intel from Sammy Smith, despite what her detractors and what the cynics say about her. It's quite a big statement, I think, for her to admit, quote, I think a lot of them were scared to talk. They were engaging in illegal activity in the woods. It's like this Lord of the Flies space where they can just be, end quote. So today on the anniversary of Elvis's death, his death itself due to sex, drugs and rock and roll, one wonders if the same recipe claimed Kylie's life. In fact, from our investigation quite recently, it it appears that Elvis died of polypharmacy, which is drug interactions. And I think that's one aspect of it. And so so one wonders, could that have played a role in what happened to Kylie? Now, the other thing that I think is another part of the dimension here is the fact that Kylie was underage. And as Sammy put it, quote, Kylie was rocking the single life. She just wanted to be open and single and have fun as a kid. And that is telling us a heck of a lot about Kylie's psychology Um, at this party and to what extent she would have been exposed to the 300. And I think this is why there's concern that she put herself or found herself in harm's way. And it's not necessarily harm's way in terms of a particular person or even a particular group, but that she may have unknowingly, and, and even the people around her, may have unknowingly um, being part of the, a whole polypharmacy scenario where um, various substances created a kind of a lethal cocktail. I mean, isn't that the obvious assumption here? And then when something happened to her, well, somebody's going to panic. I mean, who's responsible? That's going to be the next question. And it's, it's, I think, a kind of a Pulp Fiction-like scenario. What happens if somebody loses consciousness or worse when they are in your custody? Well, the answer is you're going to panic. And obviously, if you are yourself inebriated, that makes everything so much worse. And if you know the scenario in Pulp Fiction, you know the guy involved doesn't want to get involved, right? He doesn't want to save the girl. He doesn't want to help the girl. He wants nothing to do with the girl. And could that have possibly been something that played out with Kylie and People are still shocked and traumatized by that. And this is a scenario where something happened that wasn't deliberate, where um, something happened that was not entirely accidental, but it was also not deliberate, if that makes sense. Now, if Kylie did put herself or if she found herself in harm's way, I think the best resource to go to right now is Sammy's statement. And although I've already dealt with Sammy's statement in a generic way, I want to dig a little bit deeper into it. Again, the idea isn't to investigate and put Sammy through a lie detector. It's simply to appreciate her as one of the most transparent, available and accessible sources on the party, to treat her as 
a valuable source of information um, around surrounding the circumstances close to Kylie's disappearance. There's so little information, and yet we can get so much from Sammy if we just try and appreciate and allow her to speak and listen to what she's saying. Now, I also want to say I see a weird kind of tunnel vision with some folks in the true crime community regarding this case. If you tell a lie or what you say isn't completely reliable, well, then you're a liar. Then everything you say is a lie, and probably you're the perpetrator as well. Those folks have clearly never heard the aphorism, a rush to judgment. It's something that investigators are told not to do, and in fact, a lot of cases are lost because the investigators develop tunnel vision and they don't, they, they reach a decision on their prime suspect far too quickly. And that clouds their ability to objectively um, investigate a case. And the same needs to apply to the true crime community. You need to keep an open mind, even if you're certain about what you, what your opinion is. We also saw in the Chris Watts case, someone that can be economical with the truth and still be truthful about certain aspects. And I think it takes true crime rocket science to figure out what is true and useful and what isn't. To take that mishmash of fact and fiction and say, this is actually useful, this is actually important, we can do something with this, that other stuff is fluff and that needs to be discarded and that needs to be treated as unreliable, right? Now, binary thinking means the moment you find something reliable, you throw the baby out to the bathwater. That's an oversimplistic and reductionist way of thinking. People like you and me are more complex and subtle than that. Kylie is, Sammy is as well. Now, I recently wasn't 100% honest with a physio. I want to make it personal just to illustrate what I'm talking about. I went to a physio and I told her about an abdominal injury, a recent one. And I told her, I said, let's just say I was doing sit-ups when it happened. So I guess I implied on purpose that the actual cause was something else. I wasn't obtuse because I'm a liar, far from it. It's because it felt it was too personal, sensitive and actually inappropriate to be completely honest from her perspective and also from mine. Um, and also, I guess, from someone else's. Ever had that feeling that being completely honest is sometimes being too honest? So I want you to consider some of that understandable nuance from a teen who is wanting to help her friend, sincerely wanting to help her, but also not wanting to unnecessarily incriminate herself or her friends, right? Does that make sense? And she's freely already kind of incriminated herself, saying, I was inebriated and illegal activity was going on and, and so that has already been admitted. So it shouldn't be this red flag shocker, right? It should be this adds complexity to the investigation. Remember Sammy saying, I think a lot of them were scared to talk. They should have been completely open and, and it's kind of obvious. That is exactly what's been going on. She said they were engaging in illegal activity in the woods it's like this Lord of the Flies space where they can just be. Now, although she's telling us what's going on, she's also not telling us. She's not being very um, specific in what that illegal activity was. And I think it was undoubtedly um, to do with substances, but I think it was also to do with other things, right? At 16.52 in the interview, and I'll put a link to that in the description, Sammy says, we're just trying to get kids to be honest. Kids will tell kids who they drank with, right? Now, a moment before that, Sammy explains that she didn't want the media or the police to be involved in this information gathering. Now, some people will say, like, um, you know, bold, all caps, 10 exclamation marks, uh, exclamation marks, um, red flag alert. And it would be a red flag if it was adults in the situation who didn't want to talk to the media, didn't want to talk to the police, who had kind of said, you know, yes, we did do something illegal. But you don't want to expand on that red flag alert. Well, uh, some kids don't want their faces plastered all over the media. And that is actually what Sammy explained a moment earlier, just saying, um, 
you know, what they actually want their privacy respected. Um, they, and if you think about it, there are YouTubers out there hungry to destroy one quote unquote potential suspect after another in search of hate views. Sammy also provided potentially a game changing piece of evidence, just the detail that would differentiate Kylie's Honda. Uh, the silver Honda CRV from all others. It is a sticker of a bull under the rear windshield wipe, and I'm sure you know about that. But this is potentially a game changer, just in the sense of this is what would, in a way, quickly, um, what's the word, uh, differentiate her vehicle from any other vehicle. You know, a similar vehicle a silver vehicle you would quickly see there's a stick of a bull the other thing is if there's been something nefarious going on and someone has removed that sticker well you might actually be able to see that there used to be a sticker there as well so that's something else to look out for now from a pure evidence perspective the vehicle is i think quite literally the biggest clue find the vehicle and you may find kylie if not the vehicle is likely to be a giant step forward to finding her and at least narrowing down a new search location. In addition, inside the vehicle, you might find all sorts of evidence, fibers, fingerprints, DNA, who knows. It's far, far easier to make a person disappear than a car. And I think if there's a situation going on, the dilemma now is what does one do with this vehicle? At 18.33 in the interview, Sammy's asked a great question. She's asked, did you notice anyone hanging around Kylie? And this could potentially also be a game changer, but Sammy responds, to be completely honest, I was inebriated at the time. And I think that applies to a lot of the people there. So even if they came forward, what would they really be able to say? What would they really be able to remember? And I think it's a frank, if frustrating response from Sammy. But if a lot of younger women were inebriated and compromised, specifically younger women, someone who wasn't perhaps took advantage, which brings us back to somebody knows something. Is the truth eventually going to bubble to the surface or are law enforcement going to have to find that silver Honda and more and more it's feeling like pulling a rabbit out of a hat? But as I say, it's not so easy hiding something as big as a vehicle. There are only a lim few limited spaces where one can do that and one can't do that indefinitely either. So I'm not going to take it further than that. There are additional aspects to what Sammy said that I haven't dealt with yet and I might de deal with it at a later stage. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.